If there was a word that we could use to define the time, it would be confusion. It was a crucifixion, that Roman-created form of capital punishment that was used not only to put away and do away with evil convicts, but it was designed and intended to strike fear in the heart of every wrongdoer. It was three crosses that stood on Golgotha, and the soldiers are making swift work to ensure that the bodies are buried by sunset that Sabbath. Pilate's hastily made sign has been hung over his head. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin declare this to all. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. A king on a cross, a savior nailed between heaven and earth. Disciples are panicking. Barabbas is running. Soldiers are waiting. They're waiting for him to die. They're waiting for their day. To be done. They've already gone through the majority of what was required of them. They had mocked him. They had clothed him in purple. They have whipped his back and they have struck him pretending to worship him as a king. They thought that they were well in control. When without even knowing it and without even realizing it, they were absolutely completing prophecy that had to be fulfilled. They believe that they're waiting for just another criminal to die. I think that if we happened upon the scene on that day, that we would just be like the other onlookers. It's another capital punishment. It's another someone that's got to die for something that they did. When in reality, before their very eyes, they're watching the greatest act of salvation to ever eclipse humanity's eyes unfold right in front of them. But they don't understand that. We do because we have the vantage of 2020 vision looking backwards. But then the soldiers just counted it as another duty of the day. They counted the bonuses of the day. It was the soldiers that had the right and the privilege to take the garments. You know, garments in those days were much more valuable than they are these days. The soldiers in John chapter 19 verse 23 says this, that they took his garments and they gave every soldier a part. They divided his clothes. I, I don't know about the other criminals that had been crucified. It could be that they didn't have what Jesus had. I don't know. But it does tell us that they took the garments that he possessed and they gave to every soldier a part. That valuable clothing could be used maybe to sell for another denarii, and, and uh, the, the day of, of that time, clothing was valuable. It, was, it wasn't uh, made by a manufacturing machine. It wasn't made by sewing machines that spit out uh, robes on the other side of the manufacturing process. It was human hands that would uh, have that cloth bound together. It was human hands that would create the clothing of the day, and, and they were much more valuable. You may remind yourself as I'm talking about how robes then were routinely the treasures and also the spoil of war. It was Babylonian garments that were mentioned in the Old Testament. They thought they were valuable enough to hide as a booty, a treasure, something worth, worth hiding and even sinning about. Treasure, valuable pairs of clothing. And a, I don't know, maybe if you bought a pair of jeans late, you may argue my point that clothing isn't as expensive now. You're welcome to. But they, those soldiers that day, determined dividing the spoil was a routine act that they had the privilege of doing. The psalmist makes it as a, spe a special, a specific moment a thousand years earlier. They thought they were just going through the motions. But David, in his lament in Psalms chapter 22, He's speaking about a loss, but really it's a picture of humanity's gain. David is looking at his situation as pathetic. He's the psalmist. You know David? David plays the harp, gets javelins fired at him. But the psalms, many of the psalms are written by him. And, and this one day when he's lamenting about what he's lost in his kingdom because he's had to kind of get out of the palace and run for his life he's speaking about what he thinks is happening that's going on behind him with people that are now taking advantage of what he possessed and and and, and it's that story that he tells in his psalm but really it's 
scripture, a prophetic promise that's going to come to pass. We recognize the sentence that he starts out with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's not Jesus on the cross alone. That's David in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 1. And then he begins to paint a picture of Christ at Calvary without even knowing it or realizing it. He's looking at his own situation. He's examining his own loss and he begins to talk about what happens in his situation. But really, it's a prophetic picture of what's going on in the future. He said, bulls compass me about. They have cut me. I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. My strength is dried up. My tongue cleaves to my jaw. I am brought into the dust of death. We know David didn't die. But prophetically, he begins to write this psalm. And and he begins to talk about what's happening. And he said, they have pierced my hands and feet. And the picture becomes clearer as David works his way through writing that psalm of what's going to happen in the future. But then he he stumbles on this verse. He, He stumbles on it, but really it's God ordaining that moment that he's writing. He says, they part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vesture. David, without even realizing it, was getting a picture of what was going to happen around a Roman cross. And soldiers, without even understanding it, were fulfilling prophetic promise. Thinking they were just gambling for something that would increase their revenue for the day. They were just kind of something that they would gamble for, that they would get the advantage of. And, and it's just another day at the office. It's just, an, I don't know, I don't know, it says the soldiers gambled. Anybody here like, like to gamble? Hold your hand down. Keep your hand down. Okay, I'll bring it, I'll bring it into Pentecost. Uh, anybody like it when we've got Tim Hortons roll up the rim to win going? I got, I got a summary from Tim Hortons. Said you did really well this year. I got two donuts and one three coffee. I don't know what that really cost me, but they're trying to make me believe that I won. I know I didn't. I know somewhere along the line, nothing in life is free. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know what it was that... And it got all these soldiers on the same page. There's a, there's a good chance that if it was left up to just somebody, that some one of those four soldiers, I think they made before, it said that they, they made four parts in John 19, 23. I, I'm going to guess. Let's just kind of guess with me that maybe there's four. I'm going to guess that probably one out of those four soldiers would have said, would have said, ah, I'm not in. I'd rather just divide and take my part. I, I just like a piece of history. I just like a piece of the moment to take home. And, but no, no, the, the Bible tells us that they kind of all got on the same page. Why? There's something significant that happens. This isn't just a story, uh, just a little sideline to the story. There's something significant about this moment. If David wrote about it a thousand years before it happened, and, and then as we are at the cross of Christ, the soldiers, while they're waiting for Jesus to die, they fulfill prophetic words. There's something significant about this moment. John, uh, from his vantage point, he sees what's happened. He said, then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. John thought it necessary to include that information. Now those clothes were in their hands and that robe was being gambled for. Don't uh, overlook the significance of clothes in scripture. As a matter of fact, don't underestimate the significant significance of clothes on Easter. Everybody looks really good this morning. Anybody got something new on that you've never wore before? couple little it's all right I've never wore this suit before like David said with Saul's armor I haven't tried it yet but some of us have some new clothes on it you know it's it's um it's interesting when clothes 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 have great importance not only in scripture but in life the following is a is an excerpt about a request for a ruling on etiquette 
from the Washington Post just two years ago. It was a, a letter to Miss Manners. Miss Manners. Dear Miss Manners, my mother, sister, and I find ourselves in disagreement. I hope you can help. My mother and sister claim that one can wear white shoes from Easter until Labor Day. Please advise us on when we can properly be seen in our white sandals. We are all devoted readers, and one word from you will set a, settle the matter. I mean, I even know about that law. Miss Manners writes back, if only. If only I could answer that question. She says this, no rule enrages Mrs. Manners' gentle readers as much as the ban against wearing white shoes. In tones of high indignation, they carry on about weather conditions and wardrobe demands. And I, I didn't realize that this was such a hot topic. I, I had no idea. Has anybody got their white shoes on this morning? I looked for a pair in the closet. No. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I had no idea, but she goes on in tones of high indignation. They carry on about weather conditions and wardrobe demands, and then they move on to attack etiquette itself. Such a rule is arbitrary, they point out. Of course, it's arbitrary. So is whether or not you drive on the right or the left side of the road, but you should do what's expected. To do away with rules would disappoint people who enjoy order and respect ritual, but also the rule breakers. They love the rule to be there so they can break it. No matter where you live, it is comforting to mark the season with change. The advantage of the white shoe rule is that hardly anyone notices when you disobey it. But thank you for maintaining it. Sincerely, Miss Manners. Clothes manner matter today and clothes mattered through scripture. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, we find that the creator corrected Adam and Eve's attempt at clothing and made for them a coat to cover with skin. But clothing isn't just about covering. Throughout scripture, clothes declared status and portrayed authority. Clothes relayed position. Clothes conveyed connections. Clothes communicated who you were, not just what you wore. Kings had royal robes. Widows had their garments of grieving. Prisoners' garments separated them from society. Prophets, you know, they had their mantles to indicate anointing and separation. Beggars had robes to indicate their social status and position. Clothing was worn, and it indicated who you were. It had authority. It, it conveyed information that you didn't have to speak a word about. Your clothes indicated something about you. Clothing was worn to indicate your emotions. The rough fabric of sackcloth was worn in sorrow and repentance. There were garments of contentment and joy. There was, in the scripture, it speaks about a garment of praise. Anybody got their garment of praise on this morning? It says that we could put it on for a spirit of heaviness. I, I feel like there's just a little bit of joy moving in the room this morning. Anybody got just a little bit to celebrate about today? Anybody just got one moment that you could say, you know, I, I put on some brand new clothes this morning, but I got my garment of praise because before I got in the room and I, I got it on today. I got some praise because of what God's done. And we may as well just take a praise break. Is that all right? It's not in the notes, but I wish that somebody would just say, I'm thankful for what God's done. I'm, I'm grateful this Easter. I've got my garment of praise. There isn't anything that looks better on you this morning. It doesn't matter how well it's ironed or how much it costs. Here's what I know. When you came in the room and you put on a garment of praise, there isn't anything that can match that moment when you realize I got something to praise God for. I feel the help that comes from God in the room. We you just keep that up for one more minute? I'm more comfortable with that than I am a prepared sermon. I, I like it when the garment of praise gets pulled out for a minute. I, I like it when we realize blood flowed down Calvary's mound so I can walk in liberty. I'm grateful for a garment of praise today. I worship you this morning. <laughs> Would you just clap hands one more time while you're seated? Yes, it's safe to say that clothes were more than just covering. And if you begin to look through scripture, you begin to notice that there's a trend that started. It's as old as Job. 
Right there in the dark times of the darkest times of Job's life, you find it. It says that Job arose in chapter 1 and verse 20 when he realizes that he has lost everything and he has lost his family and his children have been killed. And it says that Job, Job arose and he tore his robe. It's not just Job. It's there in Genesis chapter 37 when Reuben shows back up and he thinks that Joseph's in the pit. And he finds out his brothers have sold him into slavery. It says that Reuben tears his robe because the responsibility of that youngest son was on his shoulders. And he realized, I've got, I've got a responsibility in that deep pain and grief and in that understanding of what just happened. Reuben is out of control emotionally and he doesn't know what to do and he rips his robe. Reuben does. It's, it's not just there. You find it in Judges. You find it in First and Second Samuel. You find it in First and Second Kings. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the poet and the prophets, they wrote about people rending their robes. Let's just say that this occurrence in Scripture isn't an isolated incident. There were even Levitical laws that were written about the act. There were some that were responsible to wear ripped clothing, and then others were responsible not to wear ripped clothing. In Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 4, it matters, doesn't it? If God's defining all this in Scripture, if he's laying it all out and says, Here, here's, here's something you need to be aware of. He said in, in Leviticus chapter 13 and 45, he said, And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent. In other words, if there was a leper and he had leprosy in his body, the indicator to those around him was that his clothing would be rent. He would rend his clothes and those around would realize, i, I got to steer clear of this guy. He, he's got to cry unclean. He, and we know that about scripture, but it isn't just about his cry of uncleanness that's required of him. He also has a responsibility to rend his garments. Levitical law required him to do that. Unclean, unclean, but not just the the... The lepers, there was the flip side of the coin. And you find it in Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 10. And it says, and he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head. Well, that's in the King James. It means to have his hair all disheveled. Nor rend his clothes. The high priest didn't have the right to war rended clothes he he didn't have no matter how bad life got he he never was allowed to rend his garments he he was he was the one man that indicated something greater than humanity he was the one that could walk behind that veil with the sacrifice and atone for the sins of Israel he was the one that represented humanity to deity and he was the one that represented deity to humanity. He was the intercessor. He was the man that stood in the gap. He was the one that went behind the veil. He was that man. And that man, the, the Bible tells us that, that he was not entitled. He could not rend his clothes. That emphasis led to the practical responsibility to do whatever was required to ensure that the priest's robe would not be torn. Modern Clothing has defined standards for stitches. I didn't know about that. I just knew that there's one on that old uh, sewing machine we got at home. And sometimes when I don't want to pay $50 to get a pair of pants hemmed and tapered, I just slap it on the sewing machine and... <laughs> and you get to the bottom and the hem's down on one side and up on the other and it's a little puckered the whole way down. Sorry guys, it's just mechanical to me. And cheap. I didn't know. I, I didn't know. There's all there's all kinds of, of seams that are required. There's the chain stitch. There's the hand stitch. The, the stitch class is 200 and 300 is the lock stitch. There's class number 400, multi-thread chain stitch. There's 500, the overlock stitch. Then we get right into it. I'm, I'm glad you're learning this morning. Number stitch class 600, the covering chain stitch. I don't know what kind of machine you need for that, but I don't have it. It's got threads flying everywhere. They're intertwined under, under each other, over top of one another, through the cloth, underneath, all around. That garment 
that garment's going to wear good. That garment's going to stay together in your armpits when you raise your hands. That garment, that garment's not going to tear. When the, anyone ever have your pants tear when you did not want it to happen? I have. Leave that right there. I heard Kathy's laugh of embarrassment and don't go there. I, I know that laugh. All kinds of stitches. Modern clothing has defined standards for those stitches, but the best stitch of all is no stitch at all. The stitch is the weak, weak, weakest part, no matter what. The priest robes were designed and described as such. In Exodus chapter 28 and verse 31, it says, Make a blue robe with an opening in the center at the top. Around the opening shall be a woven collar with an a woven collar with an opening like that of a garment, so that it will not tear. The indication is that that robe was to be created from the top down, without any stitching. There was no place for that seam to come undone. There was no embarrassment when the priest was going about the responsibility and duties that he had been assigned. The 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 the, the practical element was that he did not ever want to find himself in the place where the robe was ripped. He didn't want to find himself in the, in the place where it became torn, where, where he, he, he had to step out of his responsibility because his garment had got ripped. He didn't ever want to be in that place. And you say, Jack, you are taking a long time for something this simple this morning. Just hang with me. You got, you got eight minutes? We got eight minutes, so so it, it was it was it was that responsibility that they wanted to ensure. So the garment didn't have a seam that would be connected, because they didn't want to run the risk of that garment being torn. It was just prior to Jesus' crucifixion that he'd been brought to a court that had already condemned him. It was the high priest Caiaphas that asked him, "Art." Thou, the Christ. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 62, Jesus said, I am. He uses that phrase, ego am I, and, and to Caiaphas, he responds, I am. Not just I am, but the I am that I am was who he was. He, he was indicating to him, if you want to really know who I am, then I am the mighty God in Christ. That I am the anointed one. I am the one that you're most feared of right now. You, you, you say blasphemy, I can wear the charge because I am the one. I am the one that, that was manifest in flesh. I am the God man. I am that anointed one. I am <laughs> And it says in that moment, he said, you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And it's in that moment where the high priest, Caiaphas, he gets so angry and he gets so frustrated that he forgets about the Levitical law that has him bound and requires him to maintain his robes in perfect effect. He, he steps out of that and he says, the high priest rent his robes and saith, what further witnesses do we need? And in that moment, he steps out of the responsibility as the high priest. In that moment, he no longer has a, on that great weekend, you, you, you realize this is kind of a weekend that only happens once every 33 years. I mean, this weekend that we're in, 2022, Easter weekend. This is the weekend when Friday, our good Friday, is also Passover. It only happens about once every 33, 35 years. But it was that weekend with Israel. It was that weekend of Passover. It was that week, weekend where they had the Last Supper. That weekend where they celebrated that, that leaving of Egypt into the Promised Land. That, that weekend where they celebrated the Lamb being slain. That weekend where Passover was the, the blood that was applied at the doorpost so that Israel could leave Egypt and their firstborn would come with them. That, that Passover. That Passover, that promise that God had given to, to them now was standing in front of them. And, and now the high priest no longer had the right to walk through the Passover supper because he had rent his robe. 
He could no longer be the one to stand between Israel and God. He could no longer be the one that would step behind the veil and offer the blood sacrifice. He, he no longer could be that man. He had just ripped away the right for him to be that one for Israel. Matthew says it like this, the high priest tore his clothes saying, he hath spoken in blasphemy. And in that moment, the priesthood shifts from the, from the weak priest to the strong one. You see, there, there's a reason in that moment the priesthood shifts from, from the human part that had done its part as long as it could. It had played its role. It had, it had proved that humanity longer do it it wasn't a failing on God's part it was a failing on our part but now but now in that moment when when the priesthood was now it, it, it was no longer had the right to go into that place they needed a high priest that could they needed one that had the ability and the authority to represent humanity and that one was standing in front of them you see, they thought it was just going through the motions. And, and the soldiers, no doubt, I, I don't know, you can kind of see it. How did his robe not get torn? Why was his robe still complete? Why, why did Jesus' robe, why was it still, still there intact without the seams torn all the way to crucifixion? I don't know. There's little pictures of, that we see, though. We, we find we find that they take the robe off him at one point and put the king's robes on him of purple just to and mock him but I I got to think in my mind that maybe God just allowed it so that in that moment in that moment when the robe may have been torn the king's robe got torn instead in that moment the purple robe that they mocked him about was that that precious robe was just kind of waiting in the sidelines because it couldn't be rent it couldn't get torn the, that robe couldn't get torn he had to be the high priest I don't know, I, I think that when, when they stripped the robe off of him so they could lay stripes on his back with the cat of nine tails, they wanted to inflict more pain, but really it was preserving the robe. We'll, we'll just put that right there and, and we'll whip his back because we're inflicting the pain. And, and when they're inflicting pain, really, the blood is flowing for humanity and the, the blood is flowing for our healing. I, I tell you, you can't make this story up. The soldiers thought they were just destroying a man, but really they were fulfilling the promise. They thought they were hurting Christ, but they were really releasing the power and the authority of the blood. I'm talking about the high priest that man this morning. Come on, the weakness of Caiaphas was about to be replaced by the strength of the one that could. The limited sacrifice was going to be lost in the shadow of the cross. God had a plan and it was being fulfilled right down to the moment. <laughs> in John, John sticks around the cross. John stays there and he sees with his own eyes. He writes about it later to Israel. It says that he looks and he sees the soldiers take his garments. He sees them divide them up. But he's watching that one garment. That one garment. Let us not rend it. Don't let us tear it. And John writes this. He said, now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout Jesus wore the robe of requirement for the high priest without ever having the job or the responsibility initially but he knew that something was going to happen at Calvary he knew that something was going to happen at the cross that the responsibility and the right was going to shift from Caiaphas to him and that robe without seam from the top to the bottom was going to represent the one that could offer the blood for humanity forever. I, I gotta tell you, I love, I love about what God has done for us. There's power in the blood. Jesus had said, come and do a close and music if you please help me. Jesus had said, search the scriptures. They testify of me. He said, search them. 
And in this little search, two years ago, I was going through notes and I jotted that little note da down, the seamless code of Christ. And I wanted to wait until we were all together before I preached. No, I didn't. I kind of forgot about it, to be honest with you. And I was digging around like we dig around for some way to say something new and fresh. I think that if the, if the Bible says, sing unto the Lord a new song, we ought to preach unto the Lord a new sermon sometimes. But there was that verse. Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled. It's John that he writes when he speaks about this coat that was created. He, he says from the top to the bottom. In John 19 verse 23, he says from the top to the bottom. There's a Greek word that's used there. It's anathen. This word anathen has great significance when it's used by John in other places. It indicates a divine origin. John chapter 3, verse 31, Jesus, he says that he is the one that comes from above, Anathan. In John 19 and in verse 11, Pilate would have no power over Jesus had it not been given him from above, Anathan. Both Matthew chapter 27 and Mark 15 tell us that the curtain in the temple was torn, not from the bottom to the top. Human hands couldn't tear it anyhow, but it says that the curtain in the temple was rent from the top. Anothen, from above to the bottom. Jesus may have been at the mercy of the soldiers' human hands, but don't mistake it. He was on divine assignment. This garment was not just any garment, but it's drawing attention to a divine purpose. John, that's why he writes about it the way that he does years later. When Caiaphas ripped his robe, he forfeited the right to the priesthood, but God wouldn't see the office empty. Mm -mm. The priest could no longer offer that sacrifice, but there was one that could. No wonder when Jesus died immediately. That's, I just, I just, just kind of gave the scripture away, but in Matthew 27, verse 51, that, that veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. When Jesus died, and on this weekend of spiritual significance in the Jewish calendar, that high priest had just removed himself from the ability and the authority to present on behalf of the people that Passover lamb's blood. Now, there was one who could. And the veil was rent from the top to the bottom so that the world would know what we've done up until now may have just been enough, but it no longer is going to be required and it no longer can suffice the need. The emptiness of their activity could no longer be hidden. Their well-practiced protocol was no longer required behind the veil. Now there was a new high priest. And so in this little picture, in this one little sentence about a veil that was never rent, we find the promise hallelujah of a Christ that can of an anointed one that will bring the blood of the sacrifice into that heavenly tabernacle and offer it on behalf of humanity and we stand here today washed and redeemed and set free because of the power of the blood I'm grateful today I'm grateful today I'm grateful today <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9 so Christ NIV version so Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. And with his own blood, not the blood of goats and of calves, he entered into the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. He was the perfect priest that offered the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, the perfect blood that forgave every rotten sin that we ever committed. That is why we celebrate today. I tell you, I know we celebrate a resurrected Christ and we celebrate an empty tomb. But I've come to remind us that Jesus wasn't just laying in the tomb dormant. He was at work. He walked into hell and took the keys of death, hell in the grave, and walked out triumphant and victorious. He went into the heavenly tabernacle. And come on, 
the sacrifice was made for humanity of all time. We celebrate today. If you'd stand together with me. The perfect priest. Blood heavenly tabernacle for every imperfect person in the world he did the work but he leaves the responsibility of applying the blood of Christ in our lives to us the price you paid there is nothing that you can do to earn salvation you just receive it but you've got to be willing you got to be willing to walk through. Pastor Matt opened the service with 1 Corinthians 15. I said, now get off of my sermon. I didn't say, I, I just like how God kind of brings it all together. Moreover, brethren, we started with it, we'll end with it. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, until ye are saved. Anybody saved? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye had believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and the reason we're all here this morning, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. The power of the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The blood's been offered. The blood's been shed. We have a high priest. You can read about it. Go through Hebrews. We have a high priest, but we have a great responsibility. By dying to ourselves in repentance, by being buried in his name in baptism, we open our lives for the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to come in the power of the Holy Ghost. And it comes in a marked, measured way. We're filled with his spirit and we speak in other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance. It's the evidence of his presence at work in our lives. You can't pull all those pieces together through thousands of years. You can't create. There isn't someone that has a mastermind enough to create that kind of content and deliver it. God ordains it and works with his almighty hand throughout history to accomplish that purpose. So don't think that we're all here just by mistake this morning. Don't think that we're just all here so somebody can be satisfied that we came. God put us in the same room to hear the same story of deliverance so somebody could walk into salvation today so you can leave the past behind and walk into a place where a garment of praise covers the spirit of heaviness where where God's promise becomes the reality in your life instead of the pain that has obsessed you until now I wonder if you just pause and pray team at the back I'm finished we won't go through anymore But I believe that someone, your next step is applying that blood in repentance. Repentance. How do you do that, Pastor Jack? I'll tell you how you do it. You say, God, I'm turning my life around toward you. That's repentance. Your next step for somebody, if you've already repented, there's no delayed baptisms in scripture. If you've already repented, if you've already got your mind made up, I'm, I'm going to go this way with God, then your next step this morning, we're ready. We got robes. The tank's warm. It's fresh. Pastor Matt cleaned it this weekend. We're ready. We're ready. We got, we got brand new changing rooms. You can't see it behind this big wall, but there's two nice changing rooms back there. We are ready for baptisms 24-7 so that if somebody sees their need to allow that blood of Calvary to be applied to their life, that the high priest that can, the high priest that can forgive sin, the high priest that can wash it all away, the high priest that can cleanse you from the top to the bottom, that 
ultimate high priest so he can work in your life. We're ready because we believe that, that our God does that kind of work in lives. That's why we're all here. And if you have not received the baptism of his spirit, it's yours this morning. It's here to receive. I felt it in my office last night and this morning. I felt it when it came in the room today. I've, I've sensed it while we're kind of just going through this message right now. There is, there is an, there's a virtue that's flowing. So wherever you are, would you just, would you close your eyes? And I wonder if you'd lift your hand for a moment. Just maybe one hand's enough for someone right now. Or maybe that's just a, a step closer to your eyes and bowing your heads enough. But I wonder if you would just pause and if you would pray. We, we lead people in prayer sometimes, but I, I feel like someone, it's just a self-directed prayer you need to pray right now. It's just asking God to help. It's just a plea that God could only understand. We, we couldn't say it for you because we couldn't speak the words necessary, but somewhere in your spirit, God sees how you feel right now. God sees the brokenness. God sees the hurt. God sees the pain. But from above, His spirit is coming in the room. Come on, you don't, you don't have to be as loud as the preacher this morning, but I wonder if someone would just pray that prayer that you've been pausing, you've been waiting to pray, you've been, you've been looking for the opportunity to turn around, you've been looking for an opportunity to connect with God. God, your presence this morning. Would you take hand of a person that's nearby? I wonder if you pray together with them, with me this morning. Lord, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one this morning. You promised that your anointing would destroy yokes of bondage. God, you promised that your anointing would bind up the brokenhearted. God, you promised that the spirit of the Lord God, that it would rest, that it would move, that it would bring deliverance, that it would bring strength, that it would cause turnaround in lives. Lord, that's what we're praying about today. I'm asking that that precious blood that flowed from Calvary would, God, would be present to minister and move into every heart and every life this morning. Lord, your anointing is here. Your presence is here. Your power is here. Come on, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, come on, it's going to quicken our mortal bodies. This spirit, it's dwelling, it's, it's, it's working. I, I wonder if someone would just let that spirit begin to minister in this place through you to someone that you're praying with right now would you pray god let your anointing rest would healing happen god we declare it here we declare it beyond here i pray god let healing happen in hospital rooms let healing happen at hospice god would would you let healing happen let deliverance occur god that's the power of your blood it's enough this morning God, it's enough this morning. We claim it. We stand on it. We receive it. We, we declare it, God, with confidence, with authority. God, we pray, accomplish what you've begun. God, finish what you started. Act the way that you act. God, do what you do. Let your hand move. Let your voice speak. Let your wind blow. God, let it happen in this place today. 
I wonder if someone, I, I, I wasn't necessarily going to have altar call. It's, it's 11, 18 a.m., but I think we got time. I, I wonder if someone would just come to the altar because the altar is where it happens. The altar is that place of sacrifice. The altar is that place where you lay something down and God gives you something in return. It's, it's the place where when you give, God said, I'll give back. Press down, shaking together and running over. I'm wondering if anybody would just come and say, I, I'm ready this morning, Pastor Jack. I want to take the next step. We're getting ready to sing. Would you go ahead? Let's start. Save.